Hi everyone, this is Charlie Veach. I'm here with Kareen and uh, we've come along to see Polly Higgins. Uh, a recommendation from Kareen, who says that she's a very interesting person to speak to. So Polly, in a, in a nutshell, as an um, introduction, what exactly are you campaigning for right now? What we're campaigning for is to take Earth Law into the heart of the Earth Summit, which is happening in, in your country, in Brazil. Because the one in 92 was in Rio, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, and it's back again in 2012? That's right, 20 years old. So what are you aiming to do there? What we want to see is the international law of ecocide, a, a decision actually being made there, and we get leaders to stand up and say, yes, we're going to commit to making a law of ecocide and close the door to mass damage and destruction. To someone who is naturally and through years of, kind of rational thought yeah. very much against state i think all governments are liars and murderers what i'm hearing from you is you're asking you're asking to give governments more legislation to control things i know it's obviously to try and save the world and to try and control corporations but i'm a cynic i guess when it comes to governments i mm -hmm. think all governments are inherently immoral because they violate the non-aggression principle and the initiation of violence and so um like, how would you calm my fears that giving the government more powers is a good thing in this case? Well, in fact, what we're doing here is we're mitigating and uh, closing the door to another type of violence and aggression, mm -hmm. and that is a violence against the earth. Sure. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we destroy our earth, we destroy our right to peaceful enjoyment of living here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we are inextricably interconnected. Mm -hmm. So as our land gets destroyed, literally be underneath our feet, so what our ability to live uh, with good health and well-being is vastly diminished. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing is, is, of course, when we're looking at mass damage and destruction, in fact, it, we can, it can be happening in a completely different continent, but it can have adverse impacts for someone at the other end of the world. Sure. Now, as to the use of, or the creation of m even more legislation, now, at the end of the day, my ideal world is a world where we don't need any written laws at all. That, Same that, as is, mine. that is mine. My, my ideal world. Now, to get there, we need to create the bridges to that world. Mm -hmm. And that's about creating the laws that allow us to get there, laws that are premised on intrinsic values, valuing life itself. Let me just put on my resistor's hat on. Let's, I'm going to pretend I am the president of China. President who? That's his name. <laughs> and I'll say to you, I'll say Polly, or M M Mrs. Higgins, I have 80 of the world's most polluted cities in my country. I've got a population of 1.3 billion. Mm. Most of us are still peasants living on the land, but we've got a burgeoning middle class. So you, Miss White Devil from the West, Britain has enjoyed your industrial revolution, you're now all middle class, you're all advanced. America has done the same. So who are you to tell me, as a Chinese person, that you guys can go through your industrial revolution and have all your polluting, destroying the River Thames kind of mm. moment, but we the Chinese can't. It seems a bit xenophobic or racist, or it seems a bit like you guys are enjoying, you guys enjoyed your economic boom then. Why can't I wipe out the entire Chinese ecosystem for, but that's, yeah. Well, I think, I think actually you've got a very good point, Mr. Mr. Who? Who? <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, the, the Yale economy has uh, pulled you out of poverty, or certainly maybe one third of, of Chinese out of poverty. So by Yale, you mean economics from Yale University? Yeah, okay. from America. Okay. But at the end of the day, that's not actually taking you any further, is it? And China has a wonderful tradition of Taoist uh, understanding of the engagement, the interconnectivity of, of life itself. You understand. Well, maybe the Chinese do. Not, not my party, though. We don't care. We just, you know, if you speak out again, throw in jail, harvest your organs. Yeah. And yet, here you are. You've, you've created one of the greatest um, healing projects that the world has ever known in the Loose Plateau. So, your own party went in there to an area that's the size of England and Wales, size of the Athabasca tar, tar Sands, most hostile terrain in the world, and you greened it. You created a green oasis there in just eight years. You gave back into that land. Seems I like think you have you a Wikipedia of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have uh, researched my own uh, presidential policies. I hate to pigeonhole myself or ascribe labels to myself, but I guess as a philosophy graduate, as someone who's spent the last eight years going insane over ideology and what it all means, I guess I would be a pure anarchist. So, Polly, what I'm trying to say is, knowing what we know about the world, and you know probably more than most about what's happening environmentally around the world, 
can we reform this insane system or do we just need to maybe but what I'm asking you is like I, I, Karine explained to me the eco side thing making it this but it's almost like trying to tell people who rape children that raping children is bad it's like you just aren't you just banging your head against the brick wall well, I don't believe so. I, I actually think that we've got a, a wonderful window of opportunity opening up here because, in fact, I believe that governments will come on board with this for three different reasons. I, one, if they really do want to move towards the clean green economy, then it, we're going to need to give legislative framework to do that. And that's about turning off the tap upstream. That's about saying, OK, money can't flow into the damaging and destructive activity so that the money can then flow into innovation in the other direction. Secondly, what's really important here is that, in fact, we build resilient economies as well, not economies that are going to be dealing with boom and bust scenarios yeah. as we're looking at more and more oil needing to be garnered from unconventional sources. It's not so much that we're running out of oil, we're just running out of easily accessible oil. Don't worry, the war in Iran will make the rest of it easy you know, to extract. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got it all planned you know, at the highest level. And this, this yeah. is also, this is about actually, um, not so much slowing down the cycle, but cutting the cycle that's allowing us to escalate out of control here, mm -hmm. where we're looking at a century of resource wars. Yeah. So this is really about saying, okay, we have to close the door to that. We have to criminalise this mm -hmm. because mass damage and destruction leads to conflict, which leads sure. to war, which leads to more damage and destruction on either side. Yes. So this is really about how do we actually stabilise our world economi economies, but also how do we actually create world peace, in mm -hmm. truth. Uh, now, we won't know until we try at True. the end of the day. And... Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer that to remain complicit in a system that doesn't work is just not an option. We actually have a whole bunch of leaders from all over the world coming together to discuss the fate of the Earth at the Earth Summit. Mm -hmm. Now, the proposal for a law of ecocide can either stay on the table, go under the table, come off the table, and end up coming out of their mouths and them standing up and saying, OK, now we do this. Not only are we hearing it from business, not only are we hearing it from youths, not only are we hearing it from the people of the world, but actually we ourselves think, yeah, we've got to stop doing this because the route we're on at the moment is absolute trajectory to disaster. Mm -hmm. No, it is. And, um, so this is about turning things around absolutely 180 degrees doom, and moving mm -hmm. into another another it's realm. It's just asking some like sudden enlightenment for a relatively small number of people, it's like 85 mm -hmm. people that need this to is, ratify This is the remarkable thing because actually to put this law in place, it's just an amendment to an existing statute. It's far easier to do than create whole new constitutions or treaties. Mm. How do we engage with people who are potentially mentally ill or have psychological issues, i.e. they want to be president or prime minister and want power and control, how do we engage with them on a rational basis and get them to understand that? Well, yeah, how do we get people to implement things that which they obviously, by their daily actions, they're against? Well, you know, I, I think there are three things at play here. This is about calling upon our leaders to demonstrate bold, moral and courageous leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also about seeing it in terms of making the problem into the solution. This is not ultimately, at the end of the day, about locking up a bunch of politicians and CEOs. This no. is about, in fact, giving them the legislative framework so that they are empowered to move into the innovation in the other mm -hmm. direction. But the third thing, I think, is the most important thing of all. And this is about each and every single one of us demonstrating bold, moral, courageous leadership mm -hmm. and standing up and giving voice on behalf of the earth and speaking up for the earth and calling upon our heads of state and saying this is what we want and we are here to call upon you to demonstrate the bold moral courageous leadership that we want to see our governments having and our people to have as well i'm far too cynical to think that'll work like i i'm here because i i want you call because yourself I'm a love police dude hmm? i'm even wearing a t-shirt <laughs> yes so, quit the <laughs> we need angle. your love police <laughs> in action <laughs> The remit is to lower fear and raise love. But, um, Charlie, we won't know until we give it a try. Absolutely. This is about leaving a legacy for future generations. Mm -hmm. My conscience would not stay still if I was to just turn my back on this. So if I can wipe out half the Amazonian rainforest, <laughs> but say, well, 
and I argue it really well, what's yeah. to stop people using very powerful, clever lawyers to yeah. commit ecocide that's good for business? I'm General Electric, I need to yeah. create a power plant in the Amazon. So this is about creating a crime. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, what we have with, with environmental law is that it's based on fines. So fines don't work because it's catch-me-if-you-can legislation. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, I'm a corporation, I've got lots of money, I can go in there, I can cause mass damage and destruction, and if someone has the money to litigate it, I'll fight them in the courts, it'll take years and years and years, mm -hmm. and if I am found guilty, well, I'll just pay out the fine, and we can continue the business as usual. The company will pay out the yeah. fine. Absolutely. So business as usual continues. When we make a crime of ecocide, you as a CEO will end up in the dock. When you're found guilty, you will go to prison. Now let me show you how, how, how powerful this is. And it was demonstrated to me very clearly I, when I went up to Royal Bank of Scotland to the AGM nearly two years ago. Royal Bank of Scotland was, is a bank that greatly interests me because you know it's now the People's Bank. It doesn't act like a People's Bank, but it is the People's Bank. It's 84% owned by the taxpayer. Poor Stephen Hester. After, Poor Stephen. after being bailed out yeah. by our government. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephen Hester was up on stage and he was asked by a filmmaker, why is it that you're using my money, millions of pounds of my money, the people's money, to invest in damaging and destructive activity? Stephen Hester sat back and he laughed and he said, well, <laughs> it's not a crime. Now that demonstrated two very important things to me. One, there's a huge synapsal gap going on in his head between morally it is a crime to cause mass damage and destruction to the earth, and he doesn't know it. And two, when you make it a crime, he won't touch it. What is your deepest drive to want this to happen? Like, What, what kind of really gets your blood flowing about all this? I think it's actually because I believe this is all about love. At the end of the day, I and I think you do too. Mm -hmm. You've got the T-shirt on. <laughs> yeah. It's it's love for people and planets, mm -hmm. and a deep-rooted feeling that in fact we can create a garden of Eden. And a deep-rooted desire in my heart to make that happen within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely believe that we can do this because this is really about leaving a legacy. Each and every one of us can leave a legacy for future generations. One of the things that we can do is set the terms of engagement in a different framework. Sure. And that's what law is all about. It's just rules of the game, really, but it's mm -hmm. the game of life. What I'm proposing with this international law is that literally we close the door to it being um, completely normal to go and make money out of mass damage and destruction. Sure. It has become the norm, and it has become the norm because the law allows it to. The law has created a system where we put profit first. Is it actually the law that it I need to law. put yeah. to profit first? shareholder. Oh, because then you're not doing the, wait, explain to me in layman's term, how's that the law? Like, okay. So I'm a corporation, and if yeah, I don't, if I care about the environment before shareholder value, I'm breaking the law? Yeah. Really? How? Yeah. Explain because to me Because you have to put, under, under, in the UK, it's the Companies Act, under the Companies Act, your number one legal duty as a director is to ensure that you maximise your profits. That is your number one legal duty. It's all starting While to make respecting sense to me now. The law. It's starting to click in my head that if we change the law in that very simple way, and then Stephen Hester will burst out laughing and say, it's not against the law. If you look to the narrative of, of history, where we look at times when civilization has evolved into a higher level of consciousness, where we've gotten to kind of crucial crisis points, it's always been the moral imperative that has trumped the economic imperative. So we ended slavery. Mm -hmm. we, we ended apartheid. Mm -hmm. Each and every time that we've done this, there has been a huge economic incentive to keep business as usual in place. Mm -hmm. And despite that, the moral imperative trumped the economic imperative each and every time. And I'm saying that we're now at that stage again. And as we do that, then we, we shift and raise the collective consciousness of civilization as a whole onto another level altogether. Polly, I think then to shake your hand wouldn't be enough. Can I please give you a hug? Oh, <laughs> From a lovely Thank you husband. so much like, for what you do. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah, well, I'm happy to say I get it. I'm, I, oh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get it.